Let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Rick Kleinbart. I'm from Mercer Box Orthopedics. I used to be the head of sports medicine down at Hahnemann. I used to be a professor of orthopedics down at Jack Drexel when it was still in Philadelphia. Um, female athletes, a topic that I truly like to talk about. I used to have a female clinic, athletic clinic at Hahnemann. Um, Female athletes are a very unique breed, and we're going to just talk a little bit about it today. We're going to concentrate mostly on back and leg pain, but again, there's lots of problems, upper extremity, lower extremity, and a bunch of different other issues, including the female triad. But basically, just a little history, in 1928, only two dozen female athletes were in the Olympics. As of 2000, that went up to 3,800 or 38% of all athletes. A lot of this was fueled actually by Title IX, which um, basically was passed in the 70s, which opened up equal athletics for high school and for college. And as of 2000, there was over 2.6 million female athletes. The key here is that men and women are, are totally different. We're going to talk about them a little bit, some of the differences. We're not going to make a whole lecture about why they're different. We're going to try and do it specifically for each injury. In my practice, the most common things that I see in the female athlete are low back pain and lower leg injuries. Now, men and women are not different. So what happens is, is that when men and women go through puberty, there's a difference in their muscular strength. On the lower extremity, there's about a 10% difference in strength. In the upper extremities or in the upper back and arms, it can be as high as 25% difference. But in my practice, because I used to take care of professional dancers, the most common four lower extremity injuries that I saw were back pain, ACL tears, knee pain, and stress fractures. We're going to talk a little bit about each, and we're going to talk about why in a female, maybe they're prone to these injuries more uniquely than men. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the warning signs are, what you should know about it, if it's you or your daughter, and then when you need to seek treatment and what the treatments are just in general terms. So low back pain is probably one of the most common things that comes in to our practice for female athletes. And when we use the word athletes, we also consider dancers in this group. I used to take care of professional ballet dancers and professional ballet dancers are the equivalent of a pro football player. That's the level of stress that they put on their body. So when most people come into your practice, they complain of back pain and the differential or the different choices are listed on the screen. Most of the time, it really is just a strain or a sprain, which means they hurt their back. Occasionally they can herniate a disc and that usually presents as nerve pain or numbness or tingling going down their legs. The thing we wanna concentrate on today is the third thing called a spondylolysis or listhesis, and that's back pain. But please just keep in mind, occasionally you'll go to the doctor, you'll get worked up, and they won't find a really good reason for either yours or your daughter's back pain. And then you really do have to start thinking about OBGYN because you can have back pain for a whole bunch of gynecological reasons that we can talk about later if you want. I want to concentrate today on low back pain that's generally seen in a group of athletes. It's seen in dancers, it's seen in gymnasts, it's seen in volleyball players. It's basically seen in people that do hyperextension. So in ballet dancers, you'll see this when they do our best. In gymnasts, you'll see this when they land or extend. In volleyball players, you'll see this when they go to spike. And so what happens is this is pain that you're, either you or your daughter will complain about when your back gets extended, not when it bends. So when you generally herniate a disc, it hurts when you bend forward. When you, hurt, when you damage the bone, or the ligaments in the back, it hurts when you straighten or hyperextend your back. Um, it occurs pretty much in about 6% of the population. And what it looks like is this, is from repetitive hyperextension, if you see where my arrow is pointing, there's a little structure here, it's called the pars intraarticularis, and you do not need to remember it, but this is where they get a stress reaction or a stress fracture. Most of the time, they just get a stress reaction, and so they have pain in their back. Occasionally, this will actually break, and one bone will move forward of the, uh, to the other. All right, so again, this is something you would see in your daughter if you, or you 
if you do a lot of hyperextension and you have pain when you extend your back, it usually only presents as back pain. Okay, it does not usually present as leg pain, although it occasionally can. All right. The problem with this is that it's a very hard thing to make a diagnosis of because it only shows up in about 30% of x rays. So, normally, and also the other problem with it is in females, it tends to progress more rapidly than in men. So, the way we generally work it up is you come to the doctor's office, you've had back pain usually for about three or four weeks. We usually will get an x-ray in the office. And as I said, most of the time, the x-rays will be normal. You won't see anything, occasionally you will. Um, if I go back on one slide. Um, sometimes you'll see on the x-ray and you'll see a broken, what's called a Scotty dog. And again, you don't need to know this except if you come in, but this looks like a little Scotty Terrier. Here's the eye, here's the nose, here's the ears, here's the body, and this is the neck. And when you're broken, and if you can't see it on an x-ray, you'll see there's a break through the neck. So they call that the Scotty dog sign. So normally we put you in therapy. We'll occasionally give you a back brace. If you get better, we leave you alone. You do not need an MRI right away. If let's say in a month you still have back pain, then typically what will happen is you'll get a test called a spec scan, which is a special test called a bone scan, which will light up. And if that is positive, then we'll get a CAT scan. The way you make a diagnosis for you or your daughter for this is a CAT scan. But a CAT scan has a lot of radiation, so we have a tendency not to order that test right away because we don't want to radiate young people, especially females with that much radiation. Um, but once we get a SPEC scan, they can then do a special CAT scan that's got very limited radiation. If it doesn't show up on a CAT scan, then we do need to get an MRI. Even if you do make the diagnosis of what's called a spondylolysis or listhesis, the treatment truthfully is rest, activity modification, physical therapy, a brace. Almost all of these get better without surgery. Um, and they generally don't progress once the girls go through their growth spur. And rarely, if you have to, you, can, you have to have surgery. But again, it's a pretty uncommon thing. So basically, for the take home message of this, this is back pain in people that do hyperextension, generally dancers, swimmers, divers, gymnasts, volleyball players. They have more pain when they straighten their back than when they bend. They generally only have back pain, not leg pain. And you need, if it doesn't get better in a couple of weeks, you need to come in to see the doctor. They usually get an x ray. They don't need an MRI or a CAT scan right away. That's usually something we do later. And almost all of these will get better. The next thing is ACL tears. Now, ACL tears are very, very common in females. You can read the slide. Generally, they're four to six times higher in women than in men. And ACL tears are basically much more common in females in what we call non-contact ACL injuries. There's two ways to tear your ACL. One, you're playing football or sports and someone hits you. The other way is that you just hyperextend your knee and your ACL tears without contact. And that is like five to one females to males. No one really knows why ACL tears are more common in females than males. We're going to talk a little bit about it, but the history was kind of interesting. So I brought it in. The risk factors are that women are generally looser than men. The difference also is, and I didn't make this up and I have daughters, but women's thighs are not nearly as strong or do they respond as quickly as men. And we'll talk a little bit down the road on the next slide that women's anatomy is a little bit different. What I wanted to bring in just as an interesting thing is that women's ACLs have estrogen progesterone receptors. They also have receptors for a hormone called relaxin. So about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a study done that showed that ACL tears were more common in female athletes in college during their ovulation cycle of their menstrual cycle. It's been subsequently proven not to be true, but it's a really interesting phenomenon that there is some anecdotal evidence that ACL tears do vary slightly with your hormonal status. You see this very common also, if any of you have had children, there are relaxin receptors. Relaxin is a hormone that is present when during pregnancy and that allows your pelvis to widen. And basically that level of hormone stays high for three months after you stop breastfeeding. 
which is why women in their third trimester and after they give birth have back pain, have pelvis pain, have pain in the front of their abdomen, can also have joint complaint. Because again, the level of these relaxant hormones tend to stretch your ligaments. There's also been a couple studies that show that contraceptives might or might not help with this. Again, all this information is not solid yet and probably won't have much value, but it's just interesting to say that there is definitely difference between men and women, mostly because in their ligaments, they have all these different hormonal receptors that we don't know exactly what they do, but seem to affect some status of your ligaments. What we really think happens for females and why they have more ACL tears in men is that the ACL sits on a little notch between the bone and that notch in women is much more narrow than in men. Additionally, women tend to have more what we call valgus knees or knock knees because when you go through the change in life, your pelvis widens so that you can give birth, but it also increases the angles that your knee makes and that puts your knee into what's called valgus, which makes you susceptible when you land to tear your ACL. So typically what happens, I'm going to go over two things. So what happens when you tear your ACL? You're playing sports, either with or without contact. You'll generally hear a pop. Most people will feel like their knee moves. Um, their knee usually swells. Um, and it's pretty traumatic. And you end up coming to the physician's office with a big fat swollen knee. They get an MRI and typically we then reconstruct your ACL. And it's not really for this talk to talk about the different ways to fix an ACL and how we would fix an ACL different in a female versus a male with or without laxity. One of the things that is interesting though is there is a way to prevent ACL injuries in females and that's called the ACL prevention protocol. So that if you have a daughter or if you're a high level athlete, there is a way if you come to a doc's office that you can order an ACL prevention protocol. And it has been shown to decrease the incidence of ACL tears in females about 50%. And interesting, it's not only do we strengthen your legs, but it's concentrating on strengthening your back muscles, your stomach muscles, your pelvic floor, so that when you stand on one leg and bend your knee, your knee does not go into valgus or toward the other knee. And it also helps you preventing hyperextension. Um, and then if you do this, this way is a way you can hopefully avoid me and avoid having ACL surgery. All right, this is probably the most common reason that people come into our practice if you're female and you're a teenager. You come in because you have sore kneecaps. All right, usually there's no trauma, there's no injury, they're usually athletic. It's very commonly associated right, away, right around when um, you start to go through the beginning of your periods, just a little bit of general information. Girls generally start to rapidly grow six months since prior to the onset of mensi. And then it usually lasts for 12 to 18 months afterwards, at which point they're done growing. So if they come into our practice, we do go through a menstrual history because it's important to figure out where they are in the growth phase. It, and another thing, just one of the etiologies for knee pain is that when you start to go through rapid growth, bone grows faster than the muscle. The muscle takes up to a year to catch up. And that's what we used to call growing pains. But what growing pains really are is a, mix, a, a mix match, mismatch, I'll get it out. And what that means is their bone has grown faster than their muscles. Their muscles and tendons have essentially tightened, which loads the compression of the force across the joint, which produces the pain. Now, most females who have knee pains, they generally have knock knees, which is valgus. They usually will have some flat feet. Um, they will also generally have loose joints. And so what's happening is the kneecap is not getting in the groove smoothly or properly. And so you're getting uneven pressure and it's producing pain. All right. These people almost always present with anterior knee pain. It can be in a very diffuse pattern around the front of your knee. It's worse when you sit. That's called the movie sign and get up. It's worse when you squat. When you examine them, 
They generally will have pain around the anterior aspect of their knee. Interestingly, they'll also occasionally have pain along the medial joint line, which is where the meniscus is. And it's just a referred pain. And we make that differential whether they tore their meniscus or not with it, which the meniscus is a little rubber shock absorber between the bone based on whether they had any trauma, they had any injury, their knee is swollen and any, a couple associated tests. Now, patellofemoral pain, as I said, is the most common thing in the office. The good news about patellofemoral pain, oh, we usually will get an X-ray and this is kind of what it looks like. A normal knee sits in the groove. This structure on the top is your patella or kneecap. Underneath it is your thigh bone or the femur. And a lot of people, what they'll have is their kneecap will be malaligned. It won't sit in the groove properly. Again, routinely when you come in, you get x-rays. You don't need an MRI. You don't need a CAT scan. 93 people out of 100 will get better with exercise activity modification. So you don't need to go crazy. Everybody always asks for an MRI. You don't need it. Most of these are self-limited and will get better as long as you do your exercises. The problem is they do take up to two to three months to get better. And what we do to treat patellar femoral pain, and this is a little bit of an older slide. These are the exercises that you do and we can go through that. But what you're going to do is you're going to strengthen your quad. You're going to limit the way you bend your knee. We usually will brace or tape you, which helps. And now in the last year or two, not only do we do rehab for your kneecap, we will also do rehab for your core. We'll do an ACL prevention like we talked about. Interesting, it's been shown that if you can do ACL prevention rehab for sore kneecaps, you can get a higher percentage better and you get them better faster. Because again, it's hard for me to do this sitting down, but what we're doing by strengthening your core is that when you go to bend your knee, we're not allowing your knee to go toward the other knee, which is called valgus. So we're reducing the stress along the kneecap and this seems to make everybody better. If you're one of the 7% after a month or two that isn't better, then we do need to get an MRI of your knee, sometimes a CAT scan, and we have to do a whole bunch of bony measurements to determine if there's anything to offer you surgically. But as I tell my patients, kneecap pain is self-limited. You don't want to operate unless you absolutely have to. The rehabilitation for a kneecap that's unstable or hurts is at least six months and it's pretty strenuous. All right. Now we're gonna talk about the last thing is stress fractures. Now it's, this is not going to be a long diatribe on stress fractures. We're gonna concentrate because of time just on femoral neck stress fractures. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about amenorrhea and the female triad, just touch on it. And if you want me to come back, we can spend literally hours talking about the rest of the stuff. The reason that I want to just talk about femoral neck stress fractures are these are a disaster if we miss, okay? A stress fracture occurs because either you put excess load on normal bone or you put regular load on abnormal bone, all right? Now, a few things about the female athlete. Females who work out on a regular basis who are really strenuous athletes generally will end up getting a nutritional deficit which means they're burning more calories than they're taking in. And if you basically have a misbalance like that, even for a couple of weeks, it generally shuts off your, your period. And why is that important? We'll get to it. So amenorrhea, and again, I promise I won't torture you much with this. Amenorrhea is you never had your period. You need to get a period by the primary amenorrhea means you never got your period before the age of 16. And that's important because if you don't get a period by the age of 16, you lose laying down bone mass, probably about six to 8% per year. Because you lay, women lay down most of their bone mass by the time they're in their 20s. So for every year your periods are delayed past 16, you will never get to your peak bone mass, which means you're prone to get stress fractures the rest of your life. The other problem with primary amenorrhea, which means you, again, don't get your period before 16, is it increases your cardiac risk to a 40 to 50 year old. 
Secondary amenorrhea means you got a period and then you didn't get, you, you lost your period. And the other term is oligomenorrhea. And again, this is all from another talk. Oligomenorrhea means you're not getting nine periods in a year. And that's important if you're a female athlete, because if you're not getting nine periods in a year, it means that you have oligomenorrhea and you're at increased risk for stress fractures. And that means that you have abnormal bone. So femoral neck stress fractures predominantly occur in runners, right? And they usually will occur for people that have been running generally for a long time. And as they usually start to train to do a marathon or an ultra marathon. And femoral neck stress fractures are very hard to diagnose. They generally will present as groin pain, which is pain in the front of your hip. They can present as pain that goes down the inside of your thigh into your knee. You can have pain with activities or you can have pain with activities of daily living. The reason that these are a problem is they're sometimes difficult to examine. You can do a physical exam and get no symptoms. It usually should hurt when I rotate your hip or palpate, which means to touch it, but it doesn't have to. So this is a diagnosis that's made based on stories. So an example would be, I had one recently, 35 year old female runner who's getting ready for a marathon and she was kicking up her mile. She just came in with the vague history of some groin pain. We did an examination on her. It was totally normal. X-rays were normal. But when you hear that story, if that's you, those people need an MRI. And the reason is that there are two types of femoral neck stress fractures, all right? One is on, I'm gonna go back, uh, go up a slide and come back. One, if you look at my mouse is on, is this is the called the compression side. And this is where bone takes load. Those will not fail. The ones that break up here called the tension side, if you don't get to those right away, it could mean that you could need a hip replacement. So these are something that if you have vague groin pain and you're a high level runner and you're a female, you need to get an X-ray and an MRI to make sure you don't have a stress fracture. Um, if it's on the compression side, which is on the underside, you can treat it with rest, crutches, and you don't need surgery. If it's on the tension side where those arrows are, then you need to have two screws put across your hip. And this is what it looks like. So in summary, is that female and men are not the same. They're very different. Women, because of the type of exercise they do in activities, are much more prone to back pain because they do many more athletic activities and dance where they hyperextend and they get stress fractures in their back. Additionally, because of the shape of women's legs and the fact that women have what's called a valgus knee, and their thigh muscles, and again, I didn't, I didn't do the study and I have daughters, don't respond as quickly. And men are much more prone to ACL tears, non-contact the ACL tears, and anterior knee pain. Additionally, females, if they're truly athlete, highly athletic, tend to have a tendency to be, go into oligomenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea, which is lack of a period, which then predisposes them to stress fractures with the most serious one being a femoral neck stress fracture, the most common one being foot fractures. The other problem with a stress fracture is once you have one, the number one risk factor for getting a subsequent stress fracture is a prior stress fracture. So the goal of your orthopedist is not only to treat it if you have one, is but to try to prevent you from a getting one or if you've gotten one to prevent from this happening again. And so part of that also ties in with another part of our practice is that we do have bone health. We have about two physicians that do women's bone health that deal with osteoporosis and osteopenia and also help me manage medically stress fractures, whether we need to treat you, you know, chemically, whether it's as simple as calcium or vitamin D or with other medication to help prevent subsequent stress fractures. Um, I apologize that this was a relatively short talk. I hope it at least briefly touched on a bunch of the areas that are the most common things that I see in my practice. Again, we didn't talk about truly the female triad and the theories behind that. We didn't talk about upper extremity injuries. And we really didn't go through treatment options as much as we just gave you an overview of things that you should be looking at for you and your daughter.
So the first question was, I talked about preventable measures for the ACL. Are there preventable measures for the back injuries? Actually, that's an excellent question. The answer is yes and no. Um, the problem is if you're truly doing dance or gymnastics where part of the routine is hyperextensibility, you really can't do activity modification. Um, the best thing that you can do if you're doing those sports is truly to tighten up your abdomen, your back and your pelvic floor. Um, so what we recommend for people when they're doing that is again, getting into either the therapist or we have some stuff from the Olympic Training Center where I was a doc for a little while, where it really does core stabilization and back work. By getting your back muscles as strong as you can, usually you can absorb that load a little bit better. The other thing you can do from a prevention point of view is, and something that I can help you with, is that you know you can, if you're a gymnast or you're a dancer, you see if the dance teacher or the gymnast, the gymnast coach can videotape you, look at your technique. Are you overextending when you don't need to? Is there something technically wrong with the way you're landing? So like if you're a dancer again, when you're going and doing a jeté, when you land, is there something you're doing wrong technically that's contributing to your complaints? But again, the only way to really answer that, the only way to tell you to prevent that is to just get your abdomen as strong as humanly possible, including your back and your pelvic floor, because that really all controls your landing. Um, the other thing, again, I would talk about is strengthening your butt muscles, your gluteus, medius, and minimus. And that's stuff that either the therapist can do or you can just add it into your routine. The next question is, you talked about low back pain, but I have a daughter who plays volleyball and has lots of upper back pain, scapula. In your experience, is this a muscular injury? Okay, also a great question. We did not touch into that. Volleyball players, especially female volleyball players, have some other unique issues that I didn't address today. And so that's a little bit different. Volleyball players who have upper back pain, upper back pain in females is very, very hard to treat. Most of the time, what happens with those patients is their wing bone, which we call the scapular, has what's called scapular dyskinesis, which means from either lack of strength or fatigue, their wing bone isn't in the right place and those muscles get sore. It is predominantly musculature and it will get better with what we call a periscap rehabilitation program. The only thing I would tell you, you have to be careful with, occasionally in volleyball players who have upper back pain, they can occasionally get entrapment in one of their nerves called the suprascapular nerve, which can produce weakness. And it doesn't have any other symptoms. There's no sensory changes. And so that person actually needs to be seen to make sure that it's just musculature and it's not entrapment of what's called the suprascapular nerve. Um, that's a very unique injury in a volleyball player seen more in setters, if they're the setter, if you play volleyball, you know what I'm talking about, versus someone who's a slammer. So that would be someone that probably should be seen just to make sure that nerve isn't entrapped. Okay, the next question is, what's the difference between a stress fracture and a fracture? Also a really good question. So it's, it's really a degree of energy. If you see the bone that's on the screen, I don't have my mouse anymore. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. The outside of the bone is the cortex, okay? And that's the hard bone. The inside of the bone is called the medullary canal, and that's the soft part of the bone. So, the way I would look at it is if you think of a bone as the rim of your bicycle tire, the outside of the bone is the rim. The inside of the bone is the spokes. So generally when you have a real fracture, you've broken the rim. When you have a stress fracture, you broke a couple of the spokes. So it's a question of a degree. Now, a stress fracture can progress to a real fracture. Um, where then you have to treat it surgically. And there are two types of stress fractures. There are sort of low energy stress fractures and high energy stress fractures. The low energy stress fractures are generally stuff that is, you see on an x-ray, but you can usually treat them conservatively. 
the high energy ones are, are in bad places, those generally need to be fixed surgically. So a, stre a, a stress fracture is more of an overuse phenomenon that has different degrees anywhere from what we call edema in the bone to a real stress fracture, I have to put a screw across, where a fracture is more related to trauma and you've broken both the inside and the outside of the bone. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a little bit of degree and also mechanism. Um, and it says, what do you make up for, what can you do to make up for bone loss if you have loss of your period? That's an interesting question. It depends on your age and the cost. So that's not a simple question. So it, to answer it in general terms, if you are a young person who doesn't have a period, let's say, and you're 16, a lot of times we'll send you to OBGYN. They can put you on hormone. They can put you on, on the pill or some type of hormone supplement, which will help hopefully regulate you so you can avoid losing any more bone. And if you're young enough, you could probably make up some of that bone loss. If you're older and you're getting it because you're now going through you know, the change in life, um, there is a natural loss that is it's very difficult to make that up. The best way to make up bone loss is exercise. Weight-bearing type exercises help preserve your bone mass. If you're older and you've gone through the change, there are medicines such as Prolio or Fortea that again, I would refer you to our bone health specialist, that's Dr. Bills and Dr. Zambito, um, that can regrow some of your bone. It's usually injection therapy for a couple of years that will actually regrow some of your bone mass. But again, that's a question that would best be handled on an individual basis. You would need blood work done. You need a you need a bone density done. There's a whole bunch of things to be done. You'd have to get worked up and see if there truly is a cause that is correctable, or it's just related to normal aging. And then there are different options. So I I hope that answered that question. But that's something that really is much more of an individual issue. I have osteochondritis dissecans. Is this manageable without surgery? So OCD is osteochondritis dissecans. It's fancy words for you have a pothole in the bone. They're almost always in the knee. And there are some things you can do if it's in your, oh, it's in your ankle. Okay, thank you, whoever wrote that down. Um, there are some things you can do in your ankle if you didn't want to do something surgically. Again, some of this will depend on your age and activity level. But there's generally four ways to treat things in life. You'll live with it. You go to therapy. And including in that, you'll lose weight. And we're going to talk about that in a second. You can try injection therapy or you have surgery. So you have vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, and pistachio. The easiest thing to do is to exercise and lose weight. In your lower extremities, you put four times your body weight through your joints when you walk. And the average human takes a million steps a year. If you're a runner or doing that, you're maybe putting 2 million steps through a year. So just to make my math easy, I don't know what you weigh. If you weigh 150 pounds, that's 600 pounds with every step. The average human takes a million steps, which means you're putting 600 million pounds through your knees, ankles, and hips. If you lose 10 pounds, you save your knees 40 million or your ankle 40 million. So weight loss is the easiest thing. When you're bearing weight, Two things, three things generally carry your body weight. There's muscle, there's the surface of the bone, and let's say your ligaments, just to make it a little easier. Again, using that 600 pounds, that's why I picked it. 200 pounds is going to your muscle. 200 pounds, let's say, is going to the bone, and 200 pounds is going to the ligament. Now, since your ankle has a defect, it's only, let's say, carrying 100 pounds of weight, which means who's carrying the extra weight? The only thing that can do that is muscle. So by getting your legs stronger, you can unload the joint. Those are the only two things you can do non-operatively that work long-term. You do have chances with shots. Now, there's three ch chances of injection. There's cortisone, which you can do a couple of times. You can't do a lot because it eventually will damage cartilage. You can do lubricants, which is synthetic cartilage, and you can do biologics. Those three things have been shown 
to basically buy you time. They will not cure you, but they will buy you time in the sense that they can give you pain relief and anti-inflammation so that you can go to the gym and lose weight and exercise. From a surgical point of view, you can clean up an OCD lesion. And there are some ways now that you can put like juvenile cartilage there to try and repair the defect. Or you could do what's called an oats plug. All those are your options. But again, to me, long, long-term anti-inflammatory isn't the right answer because you're not actually treating anything with it. What you're treating is just the symptoms. What we need to do for you is figure out a way to cross train, rehab you and lose weight so that we can buy you as much time as humanly possible without the need for either injections and or surgery. I don't know if that answered your question, but that hopefully it did. Thank you, Dr. Kleinbart. Very good presentation, um, very informative. I'm sure um, there are a lot of people who learned a lot, including myself regarding that presentation. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for coming. If you would like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Kleinbart, please go to our website at www.mbortho.com and fill out our online request form and someone will get back to you to schedule that appointment. Or you can always call 855-896-0444. If you have any uh, questions that arise from this particular presentation, please email programs at mbortho.com and we get answers back to you. So again, thank you to Dr. Kleinbart for educating us on the female athlete. And I hope the rest of you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.